you know, e-commerce, retail, all that type of stuff will be done in the metaverse where I think it's going to transform the way we live our lives in a, in a big way. It's not about the individual investment. It's about, hey, I started with a dollar. Where do I end the year at? People don't understand branding. It's super important to really get narrowed down on that emotional connection. Construct a portfolio where I kind of protect against my own stupidity. 7,000 stocks out there. Please like, comment and subscribe if you enjoy. The bigger the potty, the bigger the guests. Looking good. Yeah, <laughs> finally got a decent camera, eh? <laughs> well, good, ma'am. How are we doing? Good? Yeah, always good. Yeah. Always good. Yeah. Blood in the market, as I said to you yesterday. I love it. I absolutely love it. I, um, I, like, I'm looking at Dropbox. Like, the valuation that I paid for Dropbox is the equivalent after they purchased, I think they purchased 30 million shares this year. Like, they're, they're down, their outstanding shares are down 30 million. The same value is somewhere around 2250. That's how cheap it is right now. And I'm looking at the company after they're after growing free cash flow 200 million. I'm like, I'll, I'll buy some more. I bought some more uh, Zillow as well at $54. And yesterday they came out with a share of a purchase program, 750 million. 750. Mm. And they said that they're after liquidating 50% of their portfolio. And I'm like, fuck. Because that was the biggest concern was, the biggest concern was, um, can they get rid of all that inventory? Share prices up 10% pre-market. I'm like, fuck, people are just dumb. You know, like Fiserv, I've just been like buying hand over fist in Fiserv. Fiserv's like, for example, PayPal's built on top of Fiserv. If PayPal does well, Fiserv's going to, they're like, they're the plumbing in the industry. It's trading at 12 times forward EBITDA. And Clover's, like their internal growth rate is uh, 11%. Their return on invested capital for all their investments is 17%. And you're getting this business for, for 12 times four. And, and, and they're merchant processing banks on the back end. Merchant processing is very, very, very expensive to change out those processing banks. So they don't do it. So the banks just continue to pay them. So it's really sticky revenue. And uh, it's trading at 12 times forward uh, EBITDA. I'm like, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll take some of that. <laughs> do you have any cash left to keep buying the dip? <laughs> uh, I've got 2%. That's it. Right, right, right. So how, how, are you, how are you now deciding where you allocate that 2%? Because I know you're a bull on some very good stocks similar to what I'm in on. Yeah. And it's hard to, de- well, for me personally, I think it's hard to decide very much so because there's a few good deals out there. Yeah. I didn't really actually, like I've been fairly fully invested for quite a while, but like the way I, I sort of approach it is like you look at BioNTech, I bought BioNTech. <laughs> After I bought it, it drops 30%, it's typical. Um. I just kept buying it on the way down. I built out like a 5% position and then in two weeks it's up 80%. Now my position's up like 45%, so I cut it by 30%. I, I got to realize some of that gain to cut the risk. So I've got a problem because I have, you know, 2% of AUM that I need to allocate somewhere else and I'm looking across the board at different opportunities and I don't really want to be like in and out of positions all the time. I want to find a company that I can hold for a couple of years and Sort of like if it dips, I can add more if I feel comfortable mm. with it. Like you look at Micron as an example, like it's just a bizarre market. It just continue to grind lower, lower, lower. And then all, all of a sudden inside one month, it's up 30%. It discounts, like it starts discounting the upside. And so when we have those big jumps, I start to rotate a little bit of capital out just to protect the, the portfolio, to prevent big drawdowns. And then I rotate it into companies like Pfizer. Pfizer is... It's just bizarre. To, I think payments, PayPal, Pfizer, even... Um, uh, world uh, is a world pay. All these companies are just dirt cheap right now. Like they've gone through a bear market for the past 12 months. And I'm like, you know, while everyone's focusing on all of these SaaS companies that have only started their decline, like DocuSign or Docu, uh, yeah, DocuSign, wasn't it? Yeah, DocuSign. Down Mm -hmm. 30% after, after hours, uh, unfavorable guidance. And so, I think they're sitting. At, I think they're sitting at a similar valuation right now too to Palantir. So obviously, if you like Palantir, I think the the valuation yeah. of twenty twenty five numbers is, is very similar. The biggest challenge, though, for a company like um, DocuSign and, and Palantir is Palantir is a walled garden. Like it's like you look at Palantir and you say, yeah, they'll have competition from Google and Microsoft and all that, which is true. They have tons of cash, but in order to build an AI system like what what Palantir have. It takes like years. They need to crunch. They need to process and crunch like two, three terabytes every day for like three years just to get something to compete with Palantir. So it's more like when you're looking at Palantir, I'm like, yeah, they're going to have competition. But nobody's been working on this for the past 10 years. So they've got like a head start of three to five years. So the revenue is going to be quite strong. It's like uh, everyone commenting about how far Tesla is ahead. They, they are getting competition, mm. but they're still the favorite company. And, and that's where Palantir is. 
that's sort of the way I look at it. And as well as it, it's a new market. We've collected all this data for the last uh, decade. We've collected tons of data. And now you got to process that data and you got to find your inefficiencies. Because a deep learning system, as an example, you can set up an artificial intelligence system where it's deep learning. All you do is throw the data into the system and it finds all these anom anomalies, all patterns that you and I wouldn't see with our own eyes. Like I can look at a chart and I can say, you know, normally the pattern would suggest that when the macro environment is favorable for stocks, if you have a company that's undervalued with sticky demand, with reasonable growth moving forward, it tends to discount at a faster rate than the market. I can see those patterns. But I might not be able to see patterns in, you know, number of days, volume, all that type of stuff where it's really like granular. And AI can do that. And that's essentially what they're doing. They're, look, they're, they're going to customers like Airbus and these type of companies. And they're essentially looking for ways to save money for them. Bring all their costs rate down. So the, their, the goal of Palantir would be like to um, essentially for their clients to save more money than their services cost. So even in a recession, would you cut that? Not really, because it has a positive ROI. And so it's kind of yeah. sticky with a, with a, a massive um, advantage relative to its peers. So I would look at sort of DocuSign and I'd say, is that a walled garden? Well, you look at Dropbox is now a significant international competitor to them with HelloSign. They translate it into 23 different languages and they pushed it internationally and they've got a top of the funnel play with 600 million users. So I look at that and I'm saying to myself, you know, I'm okay to pay with Palantir, and I think Palantir will continue pushing lower, uh, but I'll buy more at, at the right price. But it, that that's sort of the, the, the stuff that I ask myself. Well, I mean, Klarna just put out some numbers too in regards to uh, the Black Friday, some, uh, Cyber Monday weekend. And I think sales were up 300% year on year, even over the last year. So I think Q1's numbers for most companies are going to be incredible. Yeah. But especially e-commerce. Yeah. What do you think of ASOS? Uh, I think ASOS is definitely one of the better companies. Um, I haven't looked into their numbers, but I do think they're one of the better companies for sure. I think JD is probably the best UK company. You could, again, haven't looked fully looked at the numbers from an investment standpoint, but from a business standpoint, um, I know the way, I know the way JD work. I know how aggressive they are in acquiring. I know how good they are at spotting talent. Mm. So, I mean, if the JD numbers were to stack up, then I would, I would probably say go for them o over ASOS, but I haven't yeah. looked at either of the numbers. I, I modeled out ASOS and I modeled it out with a lower margin. And I came to the conclusion that the company is like over the next five years, if they, uh, I think it was to grow at like 20% uh, because they're pushing internationally. I think over mm -hmm. the next five years, I was looking at it undervalued like three, 400%. And that was with like a 6.7% margin. And the company came out recently and said that they're going to hit 8% margins. So I was like, if this is even yeah. in halfway decent, the company, like I haven't used their services, like I know you're, you're much more up to date with that, but I was like, if this is even halfway decent, it's trading at 10 times forward uh, enterprise value to EBITDA. I modeled it with 6.7% margin. It looks like it's gonna be closer to 8%. And based on a normalized uh, multiple, as of right now, they're all depressed because of uh, uh, the supply constraints. But I'm um, well, the hook. Have you, have you seen the hook group yet today? No. So, so obviously, um, a lot of a lot of them as well have followed the hook group. If you look, I think it's down about seventy eight percent year to date because it was highly overvalued and it's dragged the market completely down. Okay. So that's also one of the reasons everyone's, including Boohoo. Uh, I think I don't know about JD. So Boohoo, ASOS, um, they've all followed the same model, I believe. Obviously, just because well, definitely supply uh, side constraints is one of the one mm. of the issues, but. It doesn't help that one of the biggest groups in the UK for e-commerce has completely crashed. Yeah, yeah. I just think there's a huge opportunity there. I don't know, like, what, like the way I look at it is, I think the UK is like a little bit behind in terms of spending, and that's all ahead of it. Yeah, I think it's a fabulous opportunity. I really do. I think you're right. I think in the UK markets, you can find some incredible deals. They're growing at you know similar or faster rates to the US. They're all they're all pushing into the US, so you're getting undervalued companies. Where you invest in a US company, you're already investing in a company that's in the biggest market. Whereas the UK, they start small, they grow into Europe, and then they grow into the US. So yeah. so you can catch them really early on. And even from a private purchase standpoint, invest US investors pay so much more than a UK mm. investor is willing to pay for a UK company. So that tells you something right there and the valuation gap is gonna change in the future. I think so. Like I, I bought Royal Mail, but I think like we're in a time in the market where there's just so much stupidity. Like Royal mm. Mail, like they came out like 
not in the latest quarter, the quarter before, and he said, we're going to get some margin compression in the near term because of labor and because of um, fuel costs. Okay, whatever. But they said, don't worry about it. We'll offset a lot of it from synergies with GLS in Europe and the Royal Mail brand in the UK. And by the way, we're like an oligopoly. We pretty much control most of the parcel delivery, 52% in the UK. So I was like, fuck, it's trading at four times, or less than four times forward enterprise value to EBITDA. They've got one and a half billion in the bank, 200 after increase in the capital expenditure to 200 million pounds in free cash flow. The company is just dirt cheap. Share price drops like 10%. And then the next quarter comes around and they're like, okay, so our margins have normalized because the synergies between GLS and, and Royal Mail, which they already told us, share price goes up 10%. It's like the market doesn't believe anything right now it's like oh you missed okay we're just going to punish you and the next quarter it's like oh you were right you will and I, I should have bought in the hole but i look at the uk companies and they're just like dirt cheap but like we're in a really weird type market where like i just see a, in a, across the board where a lot of these companies are just getting absolutely demolished over re, like fiserv was bizarre to me fiserv beat they raised but their cash flow conversion, the free cash flow conversion was downgraded from 108% to 95 to 100%. percent The free cash flow conversion is how much of your net income can you convert into cash? So if it's 100%, all of your net income flows into cash flow. Um, so anything above 100%, it means like your accounts receivable, like you're able to get paid a lot faster. That's essentially what it means. So just by the free cash flow conversion dropping down to 95 to 100%, it might just mean that their creditors might need, or their, uh, the people that owe the money might need a little bit more time. That's it. They'll still get paid at some point in the future, but the business hasn't changed. Share price down 12%. I was <laughs> like, get the fuck. And then like I see Tattoo Chef, they come out and they're like, yeah, we're going to guide 54 million in the next quarter. The market was expecting 74 million. They said that the margins are going to be compressed. And quarter over quarter, since they bought New Mexico food, there's no growth in the business. Year, everyone mm. looks at year over year, they're like, we're up 40%. I'm like, yeah, but quarter over quarter for three quarters, it's flat. And they acquired a business with $48 million per year in revenue, which funnily enough, they've only been, they've only jumped 12 million per quarter from 39 million up to 50, 52. Anyway, after those earnings, share price up 70%. 70%. Yesterday it made a new, a new 52 week low, but I'm like, like, like and, and the problem with that is you have all these newer investors, they look at that and they're like, well, the share price is up, so it must be right. There must be a good result. And that's not necessarily the case, you know? So who's controlling this market then right now? Is it the retail investors or, or is it the hedge funds, the pension funds, like who, or the index? Who, who's controlling the market right now? Well, the largest component in the market now in terms of trading volumes is, is retail investors. Yeah. Significantly above. Since 2015, 16, you've just seen hedge fund after hedge fund um, shut down shop. So institutional investors have been declining. Banks have been increasing, retail investors have been increasing. Institutional investors, long short portfolios, haven't made any money because the short side, you go and you short a shit company, it should go down. <laughs> In theory, it should go down, but they're yeah. not because interest rates are so low, they just refinance. Kick the can yeah. down the road. And these companies that are priced for bankers, see, they probably should go bankrupt. Like, you know, look at Hertz. Hertz is one of the best performing stocks and went bankrupt last year because of inefficiencies. Um, mm. All of these companies, they, they go through chapter 11, restructure the debt, and they're the best performing stocks in the market. And the problem with the hedge funds is when you go in long short to offset market risk, you buy the best performers with the strongest margins and reasonable growth, and you short the worst performers. The worst performers are outperforming because interest rates are so low. They just keep refinancing, cutting their interest rate lower as interest rates keep pushing lower. And it just provides liquidity to a company that probably should be a zero. Look at GameStop and, and uh, AMC. Both of those business models, unless they change significantly, are like the only argument for both of those is a short squeeze. They shouldn't be trading at what they're trading. Like there's no, like, do you see any terminal growth? Like the, the way I looked at GameStop was GameStop should go out and they should like issue like $5 billion worth of stock, massively dilute their equity holder and then start buying like legacy brands, like digital mm. legacy brands and games for argument's sake, like Final Fantasy and stuff like that, which are probably dirt cheap right now renovate the games and then reissue them yeah. and sell them as a subscription model, something like that. That will give them long-term growth in a digital market, but selling physical product, it's not a sustainable, it's just not sustainable. Even more so when you've got physical stores because you can just sell it on Amazon. It's not like buying clothes. Like for me, I like to go into the store and try it on. So I think there's always going to be an element of physical retail as well as e-commerce. Once I buy it in the store and I know my size, I'm very comfortable then going on the website and buying it. You know what I mean? Because I know that brand, I know how it fits. 
but I always buy the first one in the store because I always end up sending it back. It doesn't fit. Like, I've got a weird-shaped body. It's kind of like a very thin waist. And so when I put clothes on, it looks like a dress. You know what I mean? <laughs> Unless it's like a specific shape. And so, uh, yeah. Um, so, so so those type of business. But when it's physical, like, it's a one-size-fit-all. I buy a PlayStation, it's a PlayStation. You know? Yeah. Yeah, so. Do, do, you, see, do you see a market where it's going to be controlled by AI because if AI is that good and it can drive for you, then why can't it predict the markets or why can't it invest for you? Do you know what I mean? It can. And there's actually models out there that are, um, really successful. But as from what I can understand is they're not, uh, it, first of all, it would take, again, it takes a while to generate AI, like to crunch that much data would take a couple of years, but there are, um, programs out there that work very successfully, but they're not regulated. So you can't raise institutional capital. Right. And and as well as that, a lot of people kind of speculate that that's essentially what uh, Jim Simons is doing over at uh, with his Medallion Fund. The Medallion Fund since 1988 has generated over 60%. Um, Jim Simons charges... What, per year? 66%, yeah. Compounded. Per year? Yeah. No. Yeah. Way. But So what the hell am I trying to invest? Why don't I just track his fund? <laughs> well, it, this is the hard part. It's like... No way. In a quarter, so 13F filing is delayed like 10, 12 weeks. So you'll see what his portfolio is. But as far as I'm concerned, it's more short-term anomalies. But as well as that, like it's, you know, his fund is closed. There's $10 billion invested in it. Most of it are inside employees. And his fee structure is fucking huge. It's like 5% management fee and 40% performance fee. But you're still netting like 39%. You're still beating them up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're still beating everyone else. And you know what's crazy about that? There, there's a famous, like people kind of speculate whether it's a Bernie Madoff type uh, scenario. Bernie Madoff was saying he was getting all these results, but it was just a pyramid scheme. People were speculating that that might be the same with Jim Simons. But you know what's crazy about that is an employee that left um, Jim Simons, what's the name of his fund? I can't think of it right now. Anyway, uh, the Medallion Fund, he was working on the Medallion Fund. When he left, he took uh, the company to court so as he could keep his pension money in the fund. So he like apparently when employees leave, they have to uh, redeem their 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 investments. When he left the fund, he didn't want to redeem his investments, so he took uh, Jim Simons and his and the company to to court <laughs> so as he could keep his money in there. So I'm looking at it going, it's probably not a scam if one of the guys working on yeah. this is. But Jim Simons is an interesting character. He worked for. Um, did he work for the NSA? He worked for like CIA, all these different government agencies. He was a, a code cracker. And he, he hired was a mathematician, all, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. And he yeah. used to crack code during the Cold War. And then he hired loads of mathematicians and loads of uh, sort of tech guys from IBM. And that's his fund is built on tech guys. It's not built on finance guys because they're looking well. for anomalies in data. And it's funny because when I listen to him, some of the stuff he started out with super simple. Like you go back to the 70s and 80s, like, what's that guy that owns uh, Liverpool? Uh, John, what's his name? Oh, I don't follow football, so you're asking the wrong person. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's his name? John something. I can't remember. Anyway, uh, maybe it's changed since then. I can't think of the guy's name anyway. I haven't looked him up in a while. Anyway, he was a trend follower. There was loads of volatility in the 70s and 80s. Leverage bets. Like, you look at the turtle traders... Um, all those guys are filthy rich, like billionaires from just following trend lines because there was yeah. so much volatility. Leverage yeah. up your book 10 times, put a really tight stop loss and let it run. And that's what they done. And there's a guy like, um, he runs Chesapeake Capital. He's probably one of the most successful, what is his name? Parker, Jerry Parker. Jerry Parker's worth over a billion dollars today. <laughs> this guy was an accountant that signed up to this program as an experiment. He was seated... Uh, a couple of million dollars from Rich Dennis, and today he's a billionaire. It's been so successful. It's following trend lines. Well, I agree with what you're saying. You also put out something the other day on Twitter, right? In terms of you know, buy things when they're depressed, yeah, and right? when no one wants them, and sell things when everyone wants them, which is super simple, mm. very hard to do because people can't control their emotions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think you're pretty good at that. I think what I like about you is if you make a decision, you stick with it. And a lot of people that are indecisive, they want to keep letting their stocks run, but realistically, they don't even know where they want them to run. Well, let me ask you a question. Um, 
when you buy a house, right? You put a down payment down, or uh, maybe not you. You're in a, a very different situation. Yeah, but ask, than yeah, people, ask me. But, go okay, so yeah. let's say you're you're working nine to five. You've got a normal job, and you go out and you buy a five hundred thousand dollar house. You got to put twenty yeah. percent down, hundred thousand dollars, and for most people, that's a big investment. It's a huge yeah. investment. But yeah. nobody worries about whether it's down on any given year because they get a mortgage and they've committed to that investment for 30 years. And the problem with the stock market is everybody looks at it as like an ATM machine where they put money in and six months later, they're going to make a ridiculous amount of money and then they're going to take it out. It's money that they yeah. don't have to gamble with. And so when the psychology, when your psychology around money changes to, hey, listen, I'm investing this money for 10 years, you make very, very, very different decisions. You're not worried about the near-term volatility. As long as you're in the right positions, you know that it's going to, normalize and so you know a classic example is like zillow Zillow, what's changed in zillow's business model okay so they sold or that they shut down the i-buying business but if they can make it work without i-buying the company is actually in a much better footing much 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 better footing than they were previously with i-buying because it's so capital intensive and so i look at it and the business model is actually probably improved if rich barton can execute he comes Mm. out yesterday and he says hey listen we've sold 50 percent of our inventory and we're going to buy back 750 million worth of stock. Now, he's sold greater than, he's liquidated greater than 50% of inventory in weeks, not months, not years, weeks. And it's like billions of dollars of inventory. I look at that as somebody that took a risk, gamble. Um, there was a good risk to reward payoff. If he was successful, he would return billions and billions and billions of dollars for shareholders. If he was unsuccessful, he might lose a couple hundred million. He was unsuccessful, he's unwinding it, and his execution is being flawless. Business hasn't changed, it's still a top of the funnel play, and the opportunity is better today. If you ask anybody today in the market how Zillow is doing, they'll look at the share price, they'll see the share price is down significantly, and they'll say it's a shit business because the housing market's collapsing, which is not a fair reflection of what's happening. The housing market's very strong. It was just poor execution and eye buying. And so I look at that as a massive opportunity where nobody in the market is willing to do any work like they're not willing to do any work they don't i can guarantee you i could pull 10 random retail investors and ask ask them to pull up the portfolio and tell me where the opportunity is there i guarantee you none of them will be able to tell me where they own all of the positions and i think like it's a superpower to know what you own and it's a superpower to understand what the fair value of a specific company is a specific company is in a specific market yeah Like if you look at Zillow now today, like they're going to buy back 5% of the float. That's not going to be the end of it. They've got $5 billion once they liquidate liquidate their their real estate position. $5 billion. They don't need that. What are they going to do? They're going to pay down debt. They're going to distribute a lot of it back to shareholders via share buybacks as well. Because they they weakened their balance sheet last year by raising debt and they also issued a lot of stock. So they're going to fix that. They're going to keep a couple of billion probably on the balance sheet for operational expenses, growth, opportunity cost that type of stuff, but it brings the valuation down today to somewhere around 10 times enterprise value to EBIT on a forward looking basis. That's Mm -hmm. a company that owns the top of the funnel. They like the own, like you look at Mr. Beast. I've seen you tweet something out about Mr. Beast and his views recently. Mr. Beast could come out, come out with a consumer product in his demographic and he could compete with probably Disney because he's, he owns the top of the funnel in that niche. You'd agree with that. I think anybody would agree with that. Well, if you look at Zillow, they get 238 million views every single month on their site, every month on their site. That's 70% of the online traffic for real estate. They own the top of the funnel. Like it's not a case where they have a portion of the funnel. They own it, 70% of their traffic. And so Rich Barton came back to turn it around to properly monetize the business. That's why he came back in 2019. He tried eye buying, it didn't work. But now he knows if he improves the consumer experience, it will work. You know what I mean? And so yeah. I, like, I, I just see all, like, all, like the incompetence of an awful lot of retail investors and institutional investors. Like Kathy Wood sold on the lows and I think she probably sold the absolute low on Zillow as an example. Hindsight will tell us whether that's true or not. And so like I look at it and I'm like institutional investors, I see a lot of incompetence. I see a lot of incompetence from retail investors because they don't know what they own. You know what I mean? You can see why though. I mean, why would you want to invest in the S&P 500 for 10% when you can invest in Bitcoin and make 50%? Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, yeah. that, everyone's skewed. Well, here's the thing, right? When I bought, I, I bought Bitcoin. I thought I bought Bitcoin late 2018. It was actually in February 2019. So I was, I'm not in it as long as I thought I was. But when I bought Bitcoin, I put 8% into it. Obviously, in hindsight, I would have put all my money in. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's done, it's done yeah. okay. Um, I looked at it and said, look, it's either a zero or it's like a generational uh, transition we're seeing. And I thought that I was late to the party at the time. 
So, I mean, like, when, when you're approaching an awful lot of these opportunities, you can see, like, just ridiculous returns, millions of percent, even back in after a crash after 2017, you see millions of percent return. Uh, but you got to buy, like, when what, what Carl Icahn was saying, when nobody wants it. Bitcoin was down 80%. And you got to be managing the risk effectively so that you don't get blown up if you're wrong. Yeah. So I've made a, I've made a lot of mistakes more recently. Um, I, I would say one mistake would have been in Zillow. Like I shouldn't have been as big in Zillow. I, I, I allocated 6%. I've got an average cost of $78. I'm down like 25, 26%. But if I had a recognized, like the way I approached it was from a macro perspective, the housing market's fine. If they break even on the eye buying, they monetize on all of these different segments, whether it's like their flex business, which is the opportunity, I think, whether it's like escrow, title insurance, all these different segments. If they could execute on that, they would make a hell of a lot of money. And um, I didn't, I didn't look at operational risk. You know what I mean? Like, in a heavily geared business, like you've got a, a number of businesses right now. You increase the leverage on that three, four, five x. How, how, like, yes, you're, you're, like, if you increase the leverage, the operational leverage, not like the M and A leverage, but if you increase the operational leverage in your business, if one quarter you've got a slowdown in terms of earnings, you still have to service that debt. And so the risk yeah. starts to increase significantly. And that's what happened with uh, Zillow. They increased the operational leverage. Uh, it's a very capital intensive business. And they poorly executed and they couldn't get the prices that they wanted for the housing. It cost them 300 million. And so I, I, I didn't recognize the operational risk. I just looked at the macro market as opposed to saying, shit, this is very leveraged. But if you looked at the same, obviously, which is why, what I do like about you, you obviously always analyzing what you did or didn't do wrong, but you can always do that in hindsight, right? Because yeah. look at, you know, you've got a few other positions that you, you love, Discovery, for example. Why mm. didn't you just wait and invest in that at 21? Because one, you didn't know it was gonna ever, gonna, ever gonna go that cheap. So you can always look at stuff in hindsight, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, how would you so how would you approach Zillow in the future? Because you would probably still look at those things and maybe make a similar decision because you still thought it was cheap at the time of investing, right? I still would have invested in it, but I probably yeah. would have weighted it differently because I would have recognized the operational risk. So instead of going so heavy, I probably would have started small. And then like yeah. you look back in hindsight and you look at it today and you say, well, if the risk was the leverage in iBuying and they've just unwound iBuying, they're buying back shares and they're actually liquidating that portfolio, the risk is a lot lower. I'd be leveraging up the position now. I'd be building it out much bigger. I bought it the whole way down. I thought fair value was 72 I bought, I, and I bought more uh, last week at 54 I bought it the whole way down. I think the business is a lot cheaper and I think my, my uh, conviction in the company started to increase, not necessarily as price fell, valuation is definitely a part of it but as we started to see that management can actually execute like so when how so when you're sorry no. when you're investing per when you're splitting your portfolio down as like you, you know you've got 100 percent capital invested and you, you i know you don't invest your positions over seven percent but how are you working out a, a probability to to for each stock how are you actually working out the probability of uh, allocating x amount to it are you actually working out the mathematics behind it or are you doing that based on your personal experience over time um, so I look at it in terms of building out a portfolio, right? So if I'm building out a portfolio, the way I look at it is like humans are pretty dumb. Like we are like, we, we have a decent batting rate average, but it only takes one wrong position to get carried out. Look at Archegos Capital. They were heavily geared in all of these different direct consumers. Viacom come out, raise some capital right at the highs. Share price drops 20%. And when you're that leveraged, it only takes one position to cause a, a chain reaction. So yeah. we can be dead right. And, and just for context, I mean, um, uh, Bill Huang, he went from $100 million net worth to $15 billion over nine years. Like his net worth just exploded. He's just been dead right for nine years. And it took one, uh, it took one decision from management of Viacom to blow up his entire net worth over three days. And so when you take that into consideration, you, like you realize that one, our batting average can be quite strong, but it will take, if we're too overexposed, it'll take one, uh, it will take just one mistake to blow us up. So you gotta be careful. And so I construct a portfolio where I kind of protect against my own stupidity. 7,000 stocks out there. There has yeah. to be a situation where at least probably 1,000 are decent, 500 are great. And then there's like 50 that are exceptional. And I'm always trying to find the 50 companies that are exceptional. 
at the same time, I can't overexpose myself to one position, so I usually have limits, like 7% uh, would be my max allocation. I broke that rule with, with, with Discovery, but 7% is usually my max allocation. And what, what that essentially means is that if that went to zero, I lose 7% of my capital. So be it. The other 93% will probably offset it because I can't be that dumb. That's the way I look at it. And then <laughs> I look at it in terms of volatility in the portfolio. So... You know, what people don't realize is if a stock goes down 50%, it needs to go up 100% just to get back to break even. And if it goes down 50%, you got to understand what caused that and what the probability of them getting out of that hole is. There's some businesses, like you look at companies like Douyu as an example. Now we're getting into very controversial Chinese stocks, but the whole business model for streaming in China has completely changed. It, so the revenue model's changed and you've got to forecast into the future completely. You have to project completely different numbers. Share price is down like 95 or 99% off an all-time high. And now it's got a completely different revenue model. If you're to hold that the whole way down to zero, you now got to assume that it's going to go up 2,000% to break even if you bought the highs. So I look at it in terms of volatility as well. So when I come down to like what's going to be my highest conviction play versus uh, lower conviction based on percentage, I look at like the volatility profile of an asset and then I look at the whole portfolio. So when I look at something like Dropbox or Discovery, I look at their business model, I look at their revenue streams, I look at their ability to pay, like if they've got leverage such as uh, Discovery, what's their ability to pay that down? Um, how sticky is their revenue? Is it a walled garden? You look at most of the portfolio companies in my portfolio, they're like walled gardens. You look yeah. at Micron, it's an oligopoly. There's only like four different operators in any in, in uh, NAND and I think DRAM has five uh, worldwide so it's like a, it's an oligopoly it's a walled garden um, like Zillow's we we're talking about have 70% of the top of the funnel um, Dropbox have 600 million users and because it's vertically integrated the revenue is very sticky a Pfizer merchant processing banks there's only really three in the United States and back end when you're talking about revenue the back end Banks don't change it because it can be very expensive. So I look at all these different elements of the business and I ask myself, well, what would be a material, what would cause a material drawdown in these type of businesses? Well, if they have sticky revenue, it's probably a little bit lower. Um, I'll give you an example of a big company I invested in last year. I looked at like Alexion Pharmaceutical. It's, it's a company that uh, supplies rare dr uh, d drugs for rare diseases. So like there might be a thousand patients worldwide, but the cost of this drug might be a hundred thousand per year. But the insurance company pays it out, and these people need it to stay alive. So the insurance company is going to pay in a recession and a bull market, and um, it doesn't matter if it's a recession or a bull market, they're still going to need that drug. So I look at that business model, I'm thinking to myself, well, if I'm paying below market prices today, if there's a margin of safety, and the revenue is very sticky, I can afford to put a bigger position. Now, if it's a different situation, like something like um, Overstock, where I've got a huge amount of conviction in it, but it's got a beta of four, meaning it's very volatile, that can pose a little bit of risk. And as well as that, I'm betting that uh, the valuation of smaller companies in Medici Ventures will be worth a ridiculous amount more. So the company might be executing the valuation of Overstock as, a, as an online retailer is, is really solid. But I'm also betting on the other side that Medici Ventures is significantly undervalued, but the volatility in that share price is very high. So I look at that and I'm like, okay, significant volatility i'm making a significant bet that these small companies are growing to big going to grow into big companies i got to wait at probably two or three percent not seven percent not the, mm. the upper rounds of six seven percent so that's pretty much how I, I i structure my portfolio and most of the big companies in my portfolio are like they're not going to have material like interruptions to their business like for argument's sake do you where you've got a a very hawkish sort of uh, government when it comes to um, culture and streaming and gaming and all that type of stuff. So there's no significant risk to their top line model, uh, top line business model and the top line revenue. And that's sort of how I look at it. And if I can have get you, that right and bring the volatility down long term, it, it averages out. Have you adapted your model at all? Because now you're a popular investor on, on eToro. Have you invested? Have you changed the model because you now know that you're looking after other people's funds? Or would you have took a little bit more risk if you weren't involved in eToro? Um, I've always kind of focused on risk, to be honest. And I'll tell you why. Because when I started investing in 2009, I wanted to be a junior analyst and a senior analyst. And then I wanted to be a portfolio manager. I wanted to be at work in the industry. And um, so I looked at, I looked at uh, my initial investment account not as a ways to get super wealthy and YOLO into X, Y, and Z and make 100, 100 times my money. 
it was more so to prove that I could I could sort of uh, manage risk. That's that was it. If I could show on paper, it didn't matter whether I had a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, a hundred million dollars. If I could prove I could manage risk, uh, I would bring that as my resume mm. to an investment bank, and I would say, "Hey, all of those guys have deg degrees, but none of them have proof that they can manage risk." And that's sort of what my ethos was. That's how I started. 2011 got lucky, bought some real estate. 2015 sold that, had a big sizable portfolio, but my ethos was still the same: manage risk. And I guess going from having nothing to having a decent portfolio um, and realizing that if I just made 20%, I'm making more money than most company directors. And then I, you, you continue to compound at those type of rates and you're like, well, if I just make 20% per year, I'm compounding at you know, the lower bands of the CEO salary. And so over time, it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger if you just manage risk. So I've always looked at it in the sense where if I can compound at 20% for 30 years, I'm going to be one of the richest people in the room. Maybe, maybe not today, but I'm playing a different game. I'm looking 30 years into the future. It's like Warren Buffett. He made his first million when he was 30. He made, I think he was like 54 when he made a billion. And then the rest of it mm. just like a, over time because he compounded at a significant rate. He made a lot of money. So I'm not thinking about like this year or next year. I'm more thinking about when I hit my, like when I'm in my, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, um, I'll have a choice whether I want to work or whether I don't want to work, but it will be because today I'm, I'm preparing for that compound of 20%. So to your point that I changed my strategy, no. I focus with 90% of my capital, I focus on protecting that. And with 10%, I go a little bit further out the risk curve. So for oh, argument's sake, buying digital assets, Bitcoin, that type of stuff, I'll go a little bit further out the risk curve and I'll take a risk there. And if they pay out, it's usually asymmetric and exponential on the upside. And if they yeah. don't, I mean, the other 90% should, should offset it. Yeah, yeah. It's a very open question because it's a hard question for me to ask whilst being so broad. But yeah. someone straight out of university, they want to make money within the stock market or real estate. What is the best way for them to start? Is it go risky? Is it to trap the S&P? What, what do you think? Well, I think most people should focus on building out a career as well, right? So, yeah. so you know, by accident, I think I actually went with a really good route. And that was like when I got out of university I started investing and I didn't like most people get out of university they don't have a lot of money unless they were gifted it from inheritance or whatever it may be but most people don't have a lot of money so you get mm -hmm. into the market and you focus in the first couple of years it doesn't matter if you lose 50 percent what matters is over the first five years can you learn enough skills for you know a reasonable cost so if you put five thousand into the market you lost fifty thousand over five years are you at a level where you reasonably understand the market for a cost of two and a half thousand dollars that's the way i'd look at it and then at that point you have to understand this is what a lot of people don't realize is that your salary your initial job that you get you're not going to get paid a huge amount you stay at that job for five ten years your salary continues to grow as you get into your 30s and 40s you're now at peak salary and that's where you really start growing your wealth it's really where you really start compounding um your your earnings if you don't know how to invest you're not going to be able to generate reasonable returns. So I would say, look, first five years, try and figure out how to do it properly and consistently. And then when you get to that point where you climb the ladder, like if you're aggressive enough and you get to maybe a hundred thousand dollars salary or whatever, plus um, even just 60,000 and you start contributing a larger portion to your, to your portfolio, that's when you start really growing your wealth. And so I would say first five years, what I would do is, I would just consist get in the habit of consistently adding to my portfolio, but getting involved in the market and learning how the ebbs and flows of markets uh, play out. I wouldn't really care about if I lost money over five years. I would care about whether I I, I learned how to invest, like I learned the, the the ropes essentially. I think people look at their current situation and they think to themselves, if I lost everything today, well then I'm I'm you know I'm never going to get out mm. of this hole. And people forget that like as you jump through careers like i just see my brother just grow his uh his salary by fifteen thousand a year um my brother is how old is my brother i think he's 29 my brother's 29 uh, year on year he's after growing his salary fifteen thousand by changing jobs very quickly as you get into the older your 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 older age you start to grow out your salary a little bit as your skills start to grow if you've got enough drive that's when you start really contributing to your portfolio so my brother could look at that now um and he could be uh, taking that full 15000 and putting it into his portfolio. It makes no difference to his previous, his previous life. Even if he just put it into 
the index. I mean, compounding at 10% per year is still fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And getting in the habit of that, like if you model out just putting $200 into an index every single month, making 10% on average for like, you know, 30 years, 40 years, you're still left with like millions of dollars. Well, where'd you see the, where'd you see the, the S&P and the indexes go? Because the year today, 23.6%. Yeah, but like, so if you're going to dollar cost average, you're going to buy the absolute top, but you're going to buy the absolute low as well, right? So it yeah. averages out over time. And if you look at the last 30 years, I mean, we went through a global financial crisis. We went through a pandemic last year. We went through um, 1987 crash. We went through a uh, dot-com bubble. We went through all these different crises and the market still generated significant returns. So over the next 10 years or even the next five years, it's highly probable that the return in the S&P 500 will diminish. Last five years was... Uh, significantly above its trend, 17.5%. So it'll probably diminish, but if you're looking over the next 30 years, it doesn't really matter what happens in five, six years. And I think that's what the biggest challenge is for people. I think you'd agree. Mm -hmm. Like people, not, like I, I, I always say I'm playing a different game. Like when people come to me and they're like talking about, like I'll, I'll put out an analysis of a company and a week later it's down like 5% and people are like, what a shit company. I'm like, it's a, <laughs> I'm, I'm, it's, it's a different, I'm playing a different game, you know? It's yeah. uh, completely different. I, I think people don't realize that like, you know, 20%, like people believe that 20% is very difficult as well. I, I, I just don't agree with that whatsoever. And they look to the professionals. If you look at a lot of hedge funds right now, they're in liquidation mode. A lot of hedge funds are downgraded in 20%. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at my performance this year and I'm thinking to myself, well, if hedge funds are getting absolutely crushed this year and uh, I'm positive, even just 1%, <laughs> Um, never mind if you're above the market. I mean, you're still outperforming the professionals. And so a lot of people put these, uh, like if you're an industry professional, apparently like that's what you need to be in order to make outsized returns. It's not true. You know, I recently posted a video about, what's his name? Um, Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton investing in the South Sea, uh, South sea Company. Uh, the guy found out at the top, he's a mathematician. Uh, he's not just mm. any mathematician, he's a very sophisticated mathematician and uh, lost a bunch of money buying the absolute top in FOMO. So you don't have to be a genius. I think you just need to be consistent. Well, what, what do you think about, um, well, I already know your views, actually. People that watch Warren Buffett, they're a little bit misled in terms of, okay, so why would you trade out of positions, Rob? Why not just buy and hold for life? Mm, why not mm. just buy and hold? Why not buy and hold? Obviously, things change in the economy. Yeah. Businesses change. They're not the same for lifetime. Every single business is on a trajectory to failure, right? Most businesses are going to fail over, over your lifetime. If you look back in the 2000s, look at all the top companies in the S&P 500, most of them aren't even around anymore. Yeah. Or they're very much you know down in the gutter. Um, so what would you say in terms of when to re when to reevaluate a stock and learn that not every stock is, is, is a lifetime hold? Yeah, well, like my investing heroes are like, every, all of my investing heroes would look at my strategy and the way I, I manage money and say that I'm an idiot. And they'd all disagree with me, every single one of them. Stanley Druckenmiller says that, you know, portfolio theory, where I, I'm not fully in accordance with portfolio theory, but I do believe in managing risk in a portfolio. He says that that's stupid. Warren Buffett, although he's well diversified, I think this is probably a comment that's probably, you know, a little bit misused, but like diversification is for idiots. Like, um, even Charlie Munger saying like, uh, was he saying that, uh, or was that Warren Buffett? Bitcoin's for, uh, is rat poison squared. Like all these different comments, like I say that in, in the sense where it's, it's, Munger. it's, yeah, it's, it's a transformational technology. Like I'm okay going mm. out the, the risk curve, whereas, uh, Buffett and Munger may not. And with, um, Druckenmiller, Miller, who's somebody that I, I, I definitely, um, am very fond of, uh, he would come out and say that like portfolio theory and, risk management and risk adjusted returns is all stupid. But the reality is over the past decade, I've managed to outperform all of those doing exactly what they said they wouldn't do. And so I look at my own performance, I listen to their wisdom and I try and incorporate it into my own strategy. And so I think the lesson that I've taken away is I think people just need to have full conviction in their own strategy. Like whatever strategy works for them, I think they need Stick to have to full it. conviction in it. And when yeah. Buffett comes out, like, do you know how many times like, I bought airliners. I paid $32.50 for SetWest Airlines. That was two or three weeks after Buffett sold it. And when I bought it, everyone said, but Warren Buffett sold it. They're going to zero. Mm. And I said, well, it, that's not what I see. Now, I sold it more recently. It was at like $48. I probably could have done an awful lot better. But um, 
I still made money on it. And that's that's the main takeaway. Even though like you have this world class investor taking the opposite side of the of the trade, it's um you gotta follow your own strategy and you gotta be able to make up your own decision. What am I gonna do? Call up Warren Buffett and say, Hey Warren, um, do you think I should sell this position? Like, why are you selling that? Like, I can't do that. So if you can't, like, people say to me all the time, Hey, should I sell this position? And it's like uh, the ticker's like, you know, like XLY or whatever. No, not XLY, like, I know that's an ETF, but it's just some random company I've never heard of. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, you know, sometimes I, I might follow a company for a year. I get, might get really intimate with, with how the company operates. And I know exactly why I would buy and why I would sell or why I'd add more or whatever. And so, like, if you, if you don't have that level of conviction, I, I don't think you should be investing for yourself. You know what I mean? I do feel for you. You've put you Well, actually, say that. You've, you've put yourself in a position where you make people money and you're either held up here or you're held down there there's no in between it's it's there's no part on the back foot yeah rob you made me money thank you it's always rob you lost me money rob you lost me money they'll never yeah. look at the nine well, times you made the money M i'm talking this is for yeah. most people which, which it's like you know you, you tell someone when to invest and if it goes mm. well you never get a thank you and if it goes wrong you absolutely hear never-ending yeah well i mean like the, the biggest thing that i like i'd like people to take away from it is like uh, you know i always say understand what you own and like i put out like a a framework of what I think the company is and where I think it's going to go. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but like, I, I, it's not about the individual investment. It's about, Hey, I started with a dollar. Where do I end the year at? You know what I mean? Yeah. And people forget that it's, it's about where you go to the, when you go to the ATM machine, what does it say? And that's it. it like, I, 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 I think that right now we have an epidemic of people just wanting to be right. And that's never what I want to be. I just want to make money. Yeah, and there's like a very, very, very small niche of people that just want to make money, and they're okay with being wrong. Like, there's a guy on on Etaro, and I looked at his stats recently. He's only right forty five percent of the time. He's up ninety percent this year. Because every time he makes money, he makes a lot of money. But when he's wrong, he yeah. only loses a little bit. But he's only right forty eight, forty five percent of the time. Up ninety eight percent or ninety percent year on year. Just insane. Hey, but but just to your point there, like I know, like I, I think a lot of the public comments are usually trashy. But I do get an awful lot of uh, feedback via email, so I don't want to I don't want to yeah. trash on everyone. I do have a, a pretty good audience, so yeah, good. Um, some kind of I've got I've got quite a few questions that I want to get through. Um, so I'm just gonna reel them off, and you can you, yeah, go ahead. You, you know, this is gonna be a little bit more of a let's say a Q and A. So the new COVID variant, how do you think it's going to affect the market? Positively. I think that it's, um, from what I'm seeing right now, it looks like it's going to be a, almost like a vaccine for the population. It looks like it's far higher transmissible and it looks like the um, fatality of the virus is a lot lower. So I think more people will get infected. It'll be a lot less um, effective on, on, on the body and I think people will build up natural immunity. Where do you think... Um where do you think this virus, like where do you think, when do you think the, fun's gonna, the FUD is going to end? So we're in, you know, peak FUD at the moment. Everyone doesn't know whether we're going in, back into lockdown and so on. Where mm. do you think, do you think we're in peak now or do you think a couple of weeks? I think the world will start to realise that COVID will eventually be similar to a common cold by the end of 2023. And it's not that it wasn't dangerous originally. It's just we built up a natural immunity. We've got antibodies to fight against it. And I think it's just going to, I think it'll be 2023. I think that this Omicron will, uh, by the looks of it, I think it could be like so viral and transmissible that everybody has it, but it's, it, the symptoms are going to be little to none and we're going to end up developing antibodies. And then by the time we get to 2023, and if that's not the case, I mean, we still have reasonable protection against it. I, I do think we're going to start mm. to unwind it. End of 2023, I think that um, this will be viewed as like a common cold. What are your thoughts on the metaverse? I love the metaverse. I think it's it's like a, it's I, I see it like the internet 3.0. Like a lot of people are talking about Web3. I don't know what Web3 is or Web3.0. I haven't looked into it. It might be something. But I look at the metaverse like the internet 3.0 or 2.0. It's like a 3D version of the internet where it's heavily interactive. Um, I think people can socialize, you know, e-commerce, retail, all that type of stuff will be done in the metaverse where... I think it's going to transform the way we live our lives in a, in a big way. Like I can get the same experience. Like I can literally put on a or VR goggles as an example and go down to the local supermarket, but it's in the metaverse. 
and I can mm. walk through the local super, supermarket from my chair, it'll give us more time, and I think it's going to improve our quality of life in that sense. A lot of people are looking at it as like a utopia. I, like, I, I don't think that's necessarily going to be the case. I spend like an hour going down to the store and then coming back, not to mention the amount of time I spend actually purchasing uh, well, I don't, my wife does, but but anyway, you know what I mean? <laughs> she spends ages going down and, and, and uh, coming back. So if you can save that one hour, like what else, where are you going to funnel that time? You've got far more time. So yeah. I think it creates the same experience, saves time. And um, I just think it's going to be transformational in a big way. Um, I don't know who the winners or the losers are, but uh, Facebook look like they're pretty, well, they're, they're the ones investing the most amount. There's different segments of it as well. My my only let's say not worry, but my only reservation at the moment is I think that VR as itself, Oculus, has been around for a very long time. Like this isn't new technology, uh, and I just don't know where it's going to be. I just don't know where the line's going to be drawn when you're sat there right this second, putting on a headset and going into a virtual world because you can do that right now and barely anyone. I don't even know anyone that does that, and I'm big into gaming. I don't know anyone that. I only I've only ever used Oculus right for for boxing. Obviously, in the future, it's going to get a lot smaller, thinner, however it works mm. out. But I also understand that it's probably going to develop into something that I don't currently understand or cannot see. Mm. Well, I could argue that we could like we could have a very interactive meeting right now instead of over uh, an internet call. We could put yeah. goggles on and we could be in person, almost like I think that it's going to be HD, three D, like you know 1080p whatever 4k image so it's almost like at some point in the future 10 50 i just think the technology is still being developed like it's still very yeah, early yeah. like you look at an awful lot of there's like so many examples of companies that were just way too early like i always use myspace and facebook and it's kind of like right now like my myspace true. was is was facebook but two years earlier but the problem with myspace was they scaled too quickly and the infrastructure wasn't there so they didn't have enough data centers, servers, and the site kept crashing. And then eventually it ended up where all the U.S., um, all, all of the U.S. sort of high profit uh, or high, high value users, they stopped using the site, MySpace. And you had a massive surge in the Philippines where the advertising rev revenue just collapses. So the value of the site just diminished. Two years later, Facebook starts and they started slowly. The technology servers and all were being built out a lot more. Um, and it was just right time, right place. And so I think that like with, for argument's sake, Oculus, probably like 10 years ago, it was before its time, you know? It's like, it wasn't yeah. ready. So they keep developing it and developing it and developing it to a point where like, you know, what's the difference between me putting a headset on and looking at a screen right now? Mm. The experience is the difference. And it might be a, a far better experience. Like you just bought loads of NFTs, right? Like that are 3D. You could have like a, a Disney Wonderland office, you know, and do interviews yeah. and you could yeah. record those interviews, the two of us in that in that office scenery or, or setting and stuff like that. And so it kind of changes the, 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 the dynamic of how we interact, I think. But yeah, it's hard to know where it ends up from here. I, I think Facebook is probably the, the easiest bet. Motion sickness is also a big issue because any time that I've put one of those Oculuses on, mm. and I don't sit well, I didn't even feel, I didn't even think that I got motion sickness. But when you sat there and you're moving your, well, that's when you you know you're moving yourself around the room and you just sat there. You, it makes you feel. It does actually make yeah. you feel really sick. That's more. That's again another reservation. But did you get an I'm Oculus? No, so, my, so ah. I haven't actually got one. My friend's had one okay. for, he's had one for years. That's why I say this isn't new technology. Like yeah, yeah. Matri Matrix style. Um, uh, video games have been around on Oculus for for years. What was that? What was that game a few years ago? It was like Pokemon. It was an interactive Pokemon. Remember, and there was like people like running across motorways and getting hit by cars and falling into canals yeah. and drowning with these goggles yeah. on. So I think like <laughs> I do think there's loads of challenges about how they're actually going to develop it because there is going to be uh, loads of challenges. I don't know. I haven't used one before. I haven't used one before. I'm, I you know it kind of started to resonate with me when. On Twitter, Real Vision had, had put up their metaverse type, uh, their metaverse uh, studio office, and I went into mm. it. It's like real gamified. You can run around their studio, and they've got different artwork on the walls and stuff. And I was like, holy smokes, this sort of changes everything. And so taking that 2D version off my screen and putting it onto my face, and it's like 3D, it kind of changes everything. I, I think it will. 
But I don't, I think, I don't know um, where. Yeah. I, don't know where. I think augmented reality will hit first, and I think it will hit in a big way first. Like when you can use your phone, you can pull things up on your phone. You know, you can scan a barcode of a product that might be on the website, and it will pull it out in front of you. Mm. Um, I sent you that thing with Nike. You can you pick some shoes yeah. on the website, and you can put them on your feet. I think that's going to be the biggest thing first. I think the stepping stuff, as you said, I think we're super, super early for this metaverse stuff, mm-hmm. and there's going to be a lot of companies that rise and fall fast. So do I, I definitely think you know people need to tread carefully there. Um, but yeah, Facebook, you know, it does get hammered, but it is a great bet because they've got a hell of a lot of capital. They're yeah. always innovating. Zuckerberg's young, and you just can't bet against someone like that. The, the hard part to bet against Zuckerberg is the guy is like he's he's worth what a hundred billion. His company is now like a trillion dollar company or close to it. Might have dipped below it, but it's a significant company. And the guy consolidates or capitulates into metaverse, mm. changes the name, the brand, everything. And it's day one startup vibe. Goes on to Gary V. He's pitching it like like a startup. Yeah, That's how yeah, he's approaching yeah. it. And yeah. I look at that and I'm like, like usually a startup knocks the incumbent off. The incumbent doesn't convert into a startup. And so you have this weird sort of paradigm shift from the incumbent consolidating into being the startup again with just ridiculous amounts of cash. And I, like a lot of people bash Zuckerberg, but I just think he's very awkward socially. Obviously, there's there's a lot of whistleblowers. I don't know what's happening inside um, inside Facebook. Um, to be br- like, I don't know like what the policy changes where there's a lot of whistleblowers that say like they were forcing like controversial stuff going on whatever to to drive engagement i don't know like to what extent that's true and uh it would be nice if if that was false and that wasn't happening and they were moderating Mm. a little bit better i don't know i know that they've got thirty five thousand people overseeing it but when i listen to zuckerberg talk about these different products it's it's i don't look at him as a ceo i look at him somebody that's very interested in technology like an excited kid and i look at that as like if i was to invest in that company like you know what's the example I'd give you? Like, but for argument's sake, GoPro. You know, Nick Woodman started the company because he he does extreme sports and he was building products that he loved. And they've got a really low R&D budget because he goes out, does the extreme sport and says, oh, we need to change this. And he comes back and it converts into cash like like wildfire. He's really good at converting low amounts of R&D into cash. I look at Zuckerberg and I'm like, well, these guys have billions and billions of dollars. He's super excited about this. He's got more cash than you know the federal reserve at this stage and he could build out this platform that he's obviously very like enthusiastic about and if he's Mm. right five billion or even 15 billion that facebook would pay for it if that went to zero if it was nothing so be it the company still have plenty of cash if it does end up paying out it probably adds like a couple of trillion to the to, to to the market cap you know what i mean yeah, definitely. And, well, definitely, and it keeps him involved with, with, you know, your Gen Zs and stuff, which, you know, is very, very important. Most companies fail because they fail to, to move with the newer generation. And obviously, mm. the younger people control the control the future. If you want to look into the future, look what the younger people are looking at. At the end yeah. of the day, you can say it's not going to work, but who are you? They're, those are yeah. the guys, as they get older, they're going to be the guys pumping capital. As you get older and safer... They, the, you know what I mean? There's new young dumb money coming in all the time, ready to push push new, let's say, either bubbles or new theories and new new changes to the world. Yeah, and that's a that's a, such a super important point to make because we're at a situation where boomers are retiring and there's a big wealth transfer over the next ten years, yeah. huge wealth transfer. So you got to look at what the beliefs of millennials are because they're the ones that are going to be reaping an awful lot of this massive um, financial tailwind, and you got to see what their beliefs are because that's going to shape the future. You know, that's what the future is likely to look like. So whether it comes to metaverse, gaming, like this company Roblox, I don't personally get it, but a lot of my generation and younger are, are well, maybe probably the younger generation, but they're the ones that are using this. And as they get older and older and older, their kids are going to use it. They're, it's going to become more mm. uh, normalized and they're going to grow into very significant businesses. You know what the thing is as well? It's, it's easier not to believe in something new because the probability of being right is far greater than being wrong. Mm. So I, I, feel, I feel like most people don't change their view because as you mentioned earlier, they want to be right than, rather than wrong. And, and mm. you know, more things don't play out than do play out. So I think that's a, a thing that, but for me, for, and I know you're the same, just gotta stay open-minded. Yeah. I believe that 
the, there's a company that will knock. There is someone that will come along and, and knock every single company off their pedestal one day, and you can't see it now. You can't even believe it, man. Now, but you will. I mean, we created a billion dollar company out of nothing from drop shipping. And I mean, yeah. if if someone sat on the other end of a call and told me that, I'll be like, what? That ain't even possible. But it. it, it Things can just move so yeah. fast. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Sentiment can change so super, super fast. One day it can be up here, next day it can be down low. It's crazy. So yeah. you've always got to stay open minded. Yeah, but a, a part of that too though is like you like you weren't afraid to take a risk either. You know what I mean? Like But what was but 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 at the same time, what was I risking? I say that to most people. Yeah, I was in yeah, university. That, yeah. I, I had no I had no money, I wasn't risking anything. Which yeah. is why I say when you're young, just gamble. Yeah. Well what I mean by well what I mean by you're willing to take a risk, like you know all of the incumbents that you guys were competing with back then like they obviously they didn't know who you were but you took the initiative to go on and start emailing all these people on social media never mind about yeah, yeah, getting yeah, on yeah. social media in the first place i mean a lot of people like you know i said to my brother last year i i started a youtube channel because i i had so much time in lockdown like in spain we weren't allowed to leave our house we could leave our house to to walk the dog <laughs> and myself and my wife were like fighting each other to walk the dog every day for 15 minutes <laughs> Yeah. so um <laughs> that's why i started youtube and then after a couple of months i'm like wait a second like you build a funnel on 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 social media and i said to my brother i'm like listen my brother is like an incredible operator like from a very young age he was um he was uh, operational manager for the whole of the uk and and um in the middle east for um a canadian company he's a really good operator i'm like why don't you jump on social media and start talking about your niche you'll grow a, a sort of funnel and you never know where it'll lead. Like I started to realize, holy smokes, like everything started to blow up. And uh, he said, no, I wouldn't go on social media. I wouldn't put my faith, like, no, I, could, I couldn't see mm. myself on the internet. You guys, like, just as, like, you guys were just like, you know what, we're just going to do it. And it paid off ridiculous. It took 10 years. Was it 10 years even less probably? Yeah, it was, you no, know, no, no. It was, well, actually, no, it was about 10 years. Yes, we started in 2011, obviously now 2021, 2022. So yeah, about 10 years. Yeah. And people only season. now see that. Well, people only now see the success. The overnight success. Ten yeah. years of hard work. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Ten years of hard work. Loads, you know, fights, arguments behind the scenes. Mm. Like, sh should we get? Do, do we keep this staff member? Do we have to get rid of them? Are they great for our vision? There's so many things that go on behind the scenes, but m that everyone just overlooks. Let me ask you a question. Like, so I, I'm I love looking at business models, um, and what I do in like my spare time, like. I would read like S1s if a company's gone public and I, I like entrepreneurship, something that I'm very interested in. Um, what difference do you see building a physical product like Able now, like which is, I guess, more M&A focused, uh, Gymshark previously versus investing in public companies? Like what, what is the, does the skill set overlap or like, what do you see? Like, what do you take away from both of those? Uh, two set well yeah i mean always bet on yourself for one so for me for example most of my time is is better spent investing in myself than than in a public company um so that's where most of my time is focused but yeah i mean the the, the transition is huge i mean i can look at some i can look at a, an a fact i i feel like i can look at someone and listen to them speak and listen to what they're saying listen to their vision for the future and i could value their company personally based on that over their numbers I mean that's not a good thing to do because yeah it probably probably mm. risky but I feel like my intuition my intuition on if someone's going to succeed is far greater than me looking at, obviously the numbers have to make sense but it depends so like if I'm if I'm going to look at emerging like if I'm going to buy a company that's now private the most important thing isn't the numbers for me the most important thing is all about the people whereas mm. a public company is a little bit of both it's more about the probably more about the numbers than the person because it's all public right but again it's still it's still very important with the team with the ceo that's more important to me than the numbers yeah especially yeah. for a private company because in startups you can have the best idea in the world if you if, if you don't want to make it happen it ain't gonna mm. work yeah, yeah and and no one i can't invest in someone and sit there and make them do the work they have to want to do the work yeah yeah that yeah it's 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 so different because like i I kind of look at what you're saying as well. Like I, you know, when I look at a business, I, I constantly like, I, I write notes about the CEOs. Like I, I, I think they're my CEO. I think they work for me. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, but I, I can only imagine it's very different. Like in terms of risk payoff, if you get it right in private markets, you get it really right. 
you get it really right. If you you to IPO, I mean, at some point, obviously, I'm not no longer involved in Jim Shark, but Jim Shark is going to IPO for billions, billions of pounds. Mm, I mean, mm. look at all the look at all the, the biggest companies in the world. There's a reason why people are VCs and they throw money you left, right, silly at little companies. They only have to get they can get they can get fifty wrong and get two right, and they're, and yeah. they've made a lot of money from it. So there's a reason why people invest in private markets. But obviously, there's a lot more risk that comes with it. But if your yeah. skill set is is good, like for example, you would be good at it, but. Um, yeah, you you would be good at investing in private markets with the right people that come to you with the right idea for sure because, you know, I feel the, like you, you. But the product in like so so the product has to be like I, the product has to be a hundred percent as well, right? So it's not just people. I, I I say that because when I look at it's very easy in a, in a in a public market to look at a product like I may not like the product, but I might see mm. gross margins growing. I might see sales growing. I can go and check reviews. I can see where the issue, like, you know, I can already see a, a massive um, uh, sort of sentiment. And certainly like, it, well, in private markets, I mean, like I, I, I started buying Gymshark clothes. It's funny because I, I told you the story, like literally yeah. a month before you reached <laughs> out to me, uh, I, st I, I just had a big purchase on, on Gymshark and I, I heard about the story, but the clothes, like for argument's sake that you guys built over there, like, they're not like normal gym clothes. Like they're like I put that on, and I swear to God, my my body weight, my strength increased. Because when I looked in the mirror, I, I I looked like fucking Superman. When I like I, you know, I was looking at, it and I was like, if I put anything else on, I don't look like that. But that motivates you. So the yeah, product yeah, yeah, in exactly. that sense is like it's much it, it, it's it's much more superior. So when I look at a company in, in in public markets, I guess it's a lot easier in a sense where I don't have to love the product, but their customer base has to love the product, and I can see that through unit economics. I guess that's a challenge in private markets as well. But the, yeah, but that's more to do with branding as well. Like, how have you branded the brand? Like, how do people feel? Yeah, yeah. People don't understand branding. It's super important to really get narrow down on that emotional connection. How would if that customer looks at your clothing? How does it initially make them feel? That's what you need to get across. If you want them to feel good in the gym, feel strong, then replicate that through your product. Make the product fit in make the product you know make them feel powerful give it put it on to people that you would like to see in your clothing that's all we did there was no rocket science to it mm. you know pe people overcomplicate business it's super super simple all you need to do is just put it on the person that you want to want it to be bought from that's going to yeah. have some type of emotional connection branding is branding is branding is something that people really 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 struggle on but if you get it right it pays off it pays yeah. incredibly well because you can add, you know, you can increase your price of your product, your gross margin increases, you know, you, you, you lower your marketing spend because people will keep returning. Yeah. So there's loads of different things. I mean, product is definitely something that you need to get right, but it's maybe not the most important. I feel like... Really? Yeah. You know what's funny? I, could, only because I love, brand, I love yeah. branding and yeah. product can always be made better, but if you get a better product, then everything else falls into place. Mm. Of course, it makes it easier, easier to sell, yeah, easier yeah. to retain. Word of mouth, everything word becomes. Growth, yeah. You can't have a shit product and expect to, expect to grow a billion dollar company like that. that doesn't really yeah. work. You can have a mediocre product and brilliant branding, and you'll be a billion dollar company. Did you ever read uh, Robert Cialdini's book, Six Principles of Influence? I don't. I don't. I don't read books. No. <laughs> I say this to. I, I say this to most people. I, I, I actually don't read that many books. Yeah. Only because terrible attention span no I, I i have audible i just put it on in the gym like it, yeah, it, yeah, I, yeah. I can get through it a little bit easier that way but That's um I, the, the other reason i got this book is because in the 1996 uh, annual general meter meeting from Berkshire hathaway uh what's his name charlie munger said that uh if you want to do your uh, friends and family a favor buy this book by robert cialdini so i said fuck it i better <laughs> listen to it and this was in 1996 so when yeah. i listened to it like all of the principles are really 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 powerful to kind of coerce people into doing something that you want them to do everything from like authority like wearing a suit um i used to wear a suit all the time and it works like people like when i walked into a store or when i walked into a building and i'm the only person in like a, an expensive suit i always got the most amount of attention whenever i wanted mm. it I st when you when I hit a certain threshold and I didn't feel like I needed anyone else anymore, I stopped doing. It. I was like, oh, I don't really feel comfortable. But there's all these different principles as well as like, you know, comparing like in the hotel room. One of them is like 30% of people uh, reuse their towels. They realize that people stop putting the towel in the basket because they're looking at, oh, if everyone else is doing, I'll do it. You know, like all these different principles. I use all those principles from time to time. They're so goddamn powerful. 
But when I implement them, I just feel really greasy and, and dirty because I feel like I'm trying to change someone's opinion on something. You know what I mean? I've done it on the YouTube channel once in a while. Yeah. And it experienced huge growth. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to post videos that, that, that I want to post. And it's hard. It's hard to do that. Uh, but I can see how, uh, how it can be very successful. And, that, and that, I guess that all comes down to branding and how you pitch it and how you, you position it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's there's loads. Of, it's it's a funny one. It's re, a lot of psychology comes into branding again. Mo, well, the the world really. I love psychology. I mean, I don't mm -hmm. I don't read books per se, but I listen to loads of different bits, like you say, through Audible. I never really listen to a full book because I like I chop and change my not a, well. Yeah, I I like to listen to different things. The same people get boring for me all the time. Mm. So I listen to loads of different people. I take try and take a little bit from everyone. If I see anyone that does something smarter than me, I'll just copy them. Yeah, and that's yeah. it. I'm a sh I am a shameless copier. Yeah, our whole brand is built. Everything we've ever done is built on copying. Mm. All we do is find different things from different brands and we just build them into one product and we make our own product from it. Yeah. I don't believe. What really frustrates me is people try and complicate everything. They try and make a new product from scratch. How about no? Mm -hmm. You just go to the brand you like. You buy three different sizes you, and you send it straight to China and you copy everything they've got and you add your own twist to it. Yeah. I mean, the amount of time and money saved by doing that has been incredible. Yeah. I, and, you know, it's funny because, like, I don't want to talk about the specific product now, but I, I mentioned before to you that we were building out a social network. And there's certain things that I use, like I use loads of different platforms to communicate with people, but it's all over the place. It's on like four or five different platforms. Like I use YouTube to do video content. I use Discord to communicate with people. I use Substack to send out emails. I use eTar to show my portfolio. Like it's, it's everywhere. And I yeah. was like, if, if I could take all of those different components, like showing the portfolio, communicating in like short form, long form, showing videos, if I could do all that and put it in one place, um, if, if, if it worked for me, it would work for everyone. And so yeah. building it, like, it, it's not something that we've done ourselves. We're like, oh, let's see what that company is doing. Oh, let's see yeah. what that's going And then just tying it all in together. And that, yeah, I think it's, it's so better because, and, and, and the beautiful thing about it is you've seen it already work. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a guess. Yeah, 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 hundred percent. It, and it, and and it does take a lot of hard work. And you know, not everyone can do it. I might sound like I'm making it sound easy because it's not easy because most mm. people can't do that, and most people can't invest like you, and most people, you know, can't be a brain surgeon. Um, everyone is an expert in their own field, and it, mm. you know, when you talk about it, you sh you should make it sound easy because you're an expert in it. It just rolls mm. off the tongue, right? Mm. But it's but I mean, I say it again, it is it is much harder than. I'm making out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Otherwise, yeah. Ev otherwise, everyone would do it, right? Yeah, yeah. 100%. So, after I remortgaged this house, it was really difficult because up until like I didn't start getting paid out from eToro until like I don't know, like March, May, something like that. I didn't make any money from eToro, mm. uh, or not even from YouTube. I had no consistent salary. All my income came from investing. Uh, but I had uh, tax report, uh, tax um, like what I paid in tax every year. So I gave it to the bank and I had more than enough. And the bank were hesitant because I had no sort of income. And I was like, fuck. Anyway, the other day I rang them when I found a property out on the coast. I was like, listen, I'm interested in this one. It's been on for sale for a while. And it's like got a community pool. It's got like tennis courts, all that type of stuff. It's like 300,000 are looking for. I was like, I'll offer yeah. 250. But I called the bank up before. I was like, hey, listen, um, what is the long-term interest rate like if I want to go fixed? And she's like, it's a little bit more than what you paid. I paid 1.2%. I was like, fuck. It was like, is it less than 1.5? She's like, yeah, something like that. I was like, well, I'm thinking about buying a house. She's like, that's fine. You just have to come in and sign the papers. So she's like pretty much approved the loan over the phone because they already have my details. So I was like, shit. That's it, pretty good. But that's an advantage too, because I can yeah. I can literally close out that deal in a couple of weeks. You're probably the same. If you have assets and the bank knows what assets you have, like they know what assets I have now because I bought this house. But if uh, you were to go to the bank, they'd probably lend you out right away. And so I went, uh, you know, like that's an advantage too, if you can get capital quick enough. Yeah, because you can you can get you can you can as you say you can get better loans from some places elsewhere, but a good, a very good, um, most embarrassing. My dog's keep tapping me. <laughs> <laughs> He's just down here. A very good uh, relationship with your bank. 
you it can put you in a position where you may really need to lend money fast and you can lend it uh, you might not get the best rate but you know they can you move very fast yeah, yeah. yeah you, but but they can move with speed so like even for me it took me a while to to get a bank relationship because you know banks generally are terrible at seeing wealth right in front of their faces you can have a lot of money right in, within their bank accounts and they don't even contact you they yeah. don't care i've got friends with millions of pounds in the bank and they don't even contact them like they really just don't care um but you need to use then the initiative to start contacting them saying, look, look you know, and, and try and meet with them on a, a weekly, monthly basis, whatever it may be, just to try and get that, to get into, you know, get in front of their eyes. Yeah. So it's quite good for me now. I can, as I said to you before, I can lend quite a lot of money at a really cheap rate. Yeah. Yeah. Which, well, which, you can scale up your business good. as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So any anything I invest in, I don't use my money. I use the bank's money and I pay it like a, like a very, very low, cheap rate. And I, especially for private investments. If you spin that off into like an SPV, you're you're sorted because that protects your own capital. Like mm. if you have like a sh like the company that you set up, if it's limited, okay, you'll lose what you put into it, but you're not liable for anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's what that's why the whole entire system is set up for the rich to get richer, which. I do think though like that you know like you look at people like Carl Icahn one of the richest people in the world like he came from nothing uh, he came from a not a poor background he got a scholarship but his parents made him go to public school came up from a very rough uh, uh, area but he's one of the richest people in the world I think like to some degree I think though you need some drive I think too many people are comfortable do you know what I mean yeah 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 like I, yeah definitely like how many close friends do you have around you Four, three. Yeah, I don't think four. I have three or four. If that, because yeah. like I'll, I'll, I might, I might meet up with someone and I might have a conversation and I might, you know, hang out with them for a little while. But our view, like, and our drive and our expectations, what we want is like just materially different. And then, like, you begin to realize that there's very few people. Like, I, I remember when I had the previous startup for smoking cessation. I had so much drive. I'd work 20, 22 hours a day to make that work. Like, I wasn't sleeping mm. at all. And I realized that I couldn't make it work because the people I built up around me didn't have the same driver. Didn't they were just looking for an easy payoff? And I was like, "Fuck, yeah. this is it's harder to do for that reason." When this guy reached out to me about the social platform, it's completely different because the guy that reached out to me about the social platform, the guy wants to build a start. He's got he's already got that drive. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he has that drive. So you, you're combining like these different uh, personalities and it. It, it works longer term but yeah i found out pretty quick that like a lot of people just don't have that drive to to to, to get to where they want to be i like yeah, true. you know true. like which is why the online's brilliant because you don't have to have people around you you can just find other people online there's plenty of different people look at look at me and you were speaking for example you live in spain i live in england do you know what i mean yeah, yeah. there's plenty of people all over the world that i speak to on a, a weekly daily basis mm. that i've never even met in person and they've got more drive you know they've got because they don't have anything and they still want to make it they're looking at loads of different things like even with this nft stuff there's people out there that know a hell of a lot more than me that have made a hell of a lot more money and i'm you know i listen to them like i don't even pretend to be any smarter than now because they're clearly the ones that have identified this this well you know this opportunity before me so i just listen to them very closely so i feel like for a lot of people out there if you, if you don't because i'll get messages and i'm sure you do there's exactly what you said I don't have anyone around me that's as motivated as I am. Okay, well, that's mm. fine. We'll go online and find people that are because there's plenty of people that are well, in gotta the same position first, as you. Right? Everyone says, like, I'm super motivated, but, like, it, that that's all lip service until you, you like, True. actually start doing something. Like, I, I didn't reach out to you and we didn't sort of curate some sort of friendship out of fresh air. Like, I was on YouTube talking about investments. You reached out to me and I, I can't remember. We were doing a podcast and we had a conversation about investments you're investing yeah. at the time and that's how it started up it's like it's sort of mutual in that aspect but like i i get people reach out to me all the time they're like hey but you know what really pisses me off the most i'd say 95 to 99 percent of the feedback that i get is what do you think about this stock mm. <laughs> i'm like yeah. there's like seven thousand stocks I, like i'm not a genius i just like yeah. try and sway the odds in my favor but i do the work first if yeah. someone reached out to me and said, blah, 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 about this stock, and it looks like a fantastic opportunity, what do you think about this stock? It's a completely different story. But it's just lazy yeah. to reach out to someone and say, what do you think about X, Y, Z? It's like, I, yeah. you know. Like, Be a little bit more specific on your question. Yeah, tell me why you like it in the first place, and then yeah. I'll, I'll tell you if there's anything that I wouldn't like about it. 
that's sort yeah. of how I look at it. Yeah, because yeah. obviously a lot of people, including myself, value value your opinion. I mean, you've got a hell of a lot more experience in the market. So, like, I would ask you the same question, but it would be like, as you say, in a, a, a try and try and do it in a simplified way, or if not, just be respectful as well of other people's time because it's so well, you know, especially when you're online and you you can't, you're almost an influencer. I know you're, you know, you don't want to consider yourself that, but you are an influencer, mm -hmm. and you know, you get messages yeah. all the and time. It's impossible, yeah. yeah, and it's it's impossible to to reply to everyone, and, and you know, as you said, that scares the shit out of you. Yeah. Why? Why would you say that? Well, I'm talking about like I'm talking my book first and foremost. And I know that my hit rate's about 70%. Yeah. And I know that I'm very good at managing risk. And I know, like, I know now better than ever. Like, I'll give you an example. On eToro, I think there's about 3,800 people copying me. There's been 5,500 people that copied and stopped copying. And I would say at least 60 or 70% of those was inside five days. Mm. And so you look at how jumpy up and down people are. It's, it's, it's pretty much like hot potatoes it's 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 pretty much gambling and i talk about a company where i'm like saying over the next 12 months the market will discount favorable outcome it goes down one percent and this somebody might have 30 or 40 percent of their entire capital in it, it goes down two percent they're sweating already it's down two percent and i'm thinking to myself <laughs> holy smokes this guy's going to go broke from listening to because like and so i i think about i, I do think about it a lot and, and a number of times of like jesus should i actually be online talking about stocks you know what i mean Mm. That's what I think about sometimes. I genuinely do because I, I sometimes I think it can be counterintuitive, because. But at the same time, I know if I don't do it, they'll find it from somebody else. Hundred percent. Just you know, remember that your value, your value you're giving out is always better than your on your lot. Well, than your losses, obviously, mm -hmm. and you influence a lot more people than you don't influence. So you should definitely continue to do it. It's just a hard one because it, as you said, when your life is all about influencing, you know. It's, because kind of that's how you've made it. I mean, it, it, it's hard to ignore ev all the questions and yeah. you know, everything that comes in. Yeah, and there's a it lot. It's very tough. What's your there's a lot, yeah. What's your inbox look like? Um, like, I'll tell you right now what my inbox is. So my email that I started... Well, my, my inbox is different to yours because you put out your... Well, people know your email, right? Yeah. People, less people know my email. Well, my email is on the homepage. Not, I didn't think a lot of people would know about it, but I just there's like 1,500 unread messages. That's only because you're Substack as well, I'm assuming. No, I, I, I pushed that into a different email. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. So you just so you put your normal email out to everyone? Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. I've got like 10, 11 <laughs> different emails. I'm talking about the one that's on the, um, that I have for like Robert at popularinvestor.com. Right. There's, like, th there's no way I can keep up with it. I have a combination of crypto scam emails that come in like 100 times a day, a combination of brokers after me to do um, promotions, a combination mm. of uh, investment f uh, funds that are asking me to uh, promote this stock or whatever. And, and, and it's so repetitive that like when I actually somebody sends an email that I think is worthwhile reading, I can't find it. Yeah, yeah, and so like yeah. it's it's kind of counterintuitive to put your email out there because it just fills up so quickly you can't see anything and at yeah. the same time it's like you're missing all this uh, different information so and as well as that like on on youtube as well i don't know if you've noticed but after they stop catching these scammers the scammers are back anyway but a lot of the messages filter out into um uh th they get held for review and i'm like shit i've got more work to do i gotta review all these messages that look perfectly normal and so it's like, uh, yeah, it's pretty hard to see everything that's going on. But if you get like some type of application form, then you can at least filter filter people's questions. Yeah. Um, I got, that's I, what I, we do. Yeah, yeah I got definitely got to do better. Yeah, you can, you, there's definitely better ways to do it. But as you said, it's really hard. You miss out on the good, you know, you take on, you almost take on so much shite that you, you miss out on the very good people, which is very frustrating. Mm, mm. In the early days, it was so good because... Uh, for argument's sake, I met that uh, a couple of developers. And we're, I'm, I'm building out a, a platform like Duolingo for finance. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Into different segments. So everything from valuations, but also like understanding uh, this is what I want to build it into. But I'm also built like from valuations, balance sheet, everything about balance sheets, different ratios. Not my opinion, but just what they are, like giving people the tools. Yeah. Um, a guy reached out to me and said that he was a developer. He's starting to invest. He watches my videos. He's like, he doesn't understand any of it. And he's like, hey, would you help me build out a Duolingo app like for finance? I was like, yeah. So he <laughs> like he takes my domain expertise. Like if I didn't do that, like 
every time somebody asks me, hey, what does this mean? I just send them the app. Hey, the answers are in there. If yeah. you do it all, you'll understand my video. Don't. Simple. But I think it'll help a lot of people. So um, if I didn't, like in the early days, those opportunities came about, I don't, I don't see any of them anymore because it's just too much volume. Yeah. What, what, what are your top three crypto picks? I... I would stick with, personally, I just stick with Bitcoin first and foremost, yeah. because like, if, if you think about it, like we were talking about branding, um, if you think about branding in terms of crypto, I think that's going to be one of the biggest winners for this space, simply because people recognize it. So if you were to dip your toes in crypto, the first thing that you dip your toes in is not going to be Flocky Inu that was mm. named after Elon Musk's dog. It's probably going to be Bitcoin, <laughs> you know what I mean, where <laughs> institutions actually own it. And so, like, I yeah. look at Bitcoin and I think to myself, okay, it's a trillion, uh, a little bit more than a trillion dollar market cap. You got to ask yourself, what's it solving? A lot of people say, like, it's not a, an inflation hedge asset. It's not a store of value. And today, that might, be, that might be the case. And I've always said that the reason why I own is because we're discounting a store of value. It's a, it's a scaling technology. And um, if, it, if it does end up being a scale of value or a store of value, it would have some sort of proximity to, for argument's sake, gold, seven, ten trillion dollar market cap. So I still think conservatively seven to ten times on the upside from current prices is not completely out of this world. So I think that that's yeah. probably the safest bet. But it, it's it's not an easy asset to hold. I mean, we just went through a fifty percent decline. Everyone had a heart attack, and as the roller coaster goes, we're back up to highs. You know, and so it's not an easy asset class for a lot of people to hold. I think you got to be mega patient and you really got to understand what your future expectations are regarding a store of value it's already acting as a store of value in emerging markets look at turkey so you have erdogan yep. looking after their central bank and it's just a joke over there where to combat inflation he's cutting interest rates he's making money cheaper so as people can spend more into an inflationary bus and inflation just keeps running out of control as the turkish lira just collapses the adoption rate in turkey is 19 percent for bitcoin Surprise, wow. surprise. I, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Nigeria has 10% uh, inflation. Uh, I think it might be even be a little bit more than that. Nigeria's adoption rate is 30%. So when you see these yep. different regions in market, emerging markets with high inflation, the adoption rate's a lot higher. And so with the United States having 6%, it'll probably moderate somewhere closer to 3 4%. Leaving the money in the bank and collecting like five basis points, if you can, per year on your savings account doesn't make sense. No. So if you look at if you're looking for a store of value that's deflationary in nature, Bitcoin it solves that. But it's a scaling technology. You need to own a piece of the network. It's not like opening a checking account where you pass it along. You know, like where you just create one out of fresh air. You have to buy a piece of the network, and by default, it pushes the price higher. So I think Bitcoin is definitely still one of the best opportunities. And then I I, th I guess one of the smart contracts. So like you've got Solana, you've got Cardano, and you've got Ethereum. I don't know which one wins. Mm. Um, I would look at it in turn like you know Solana might have the biggest opportunity because I think it's got the smallest market cap so far um, I don't know which one wins and that's where it gets a little bit challenging for me I was very lucky last year I bought some of the utility tokens on exchanges I bought some KuCoin shares and I bought some Binance but that wasn't like a, a genius bet to catch it was like hey micro uh, micro strategy are buying Bitcoin this is the institutional phase volumes are going to increase these exchanges are going to do very well. I bought some Binance. I bought some um, some KuCoin shares, and uh, I also that's why I own Overstock uh, T Zero. Yep. Their platform is an exchange. Yep. So I'm so it's it's really I would say smart contracts. Uh, Bitcoin to me is still the dominant one, and then I would look at uh, some of the exchanges. But uh, we've discounted a lot, so like I think you got to re realize that at least for this bull market. We've discounted a lot already. Uh, I still think there's more upside, but I do think that um, next year there'll be some challenges. And then, what, what about what about Q1? What do you think? We, what's going to happen? What do you think we're going? to... Yeah, Q1, 2022. What's yes. Gonna look? So, so the macro data looks a little bit of a mess right now because historically, you look at uh, PMIs and you look at consumer confidence, and both of those have a correlation to GDP of about 85 percent. And if you look at PMIs, they suggest that GDP is going to remain strong. And if you look at consumer confidence, it suggests that GDP is going to crash. And so if you look a little bit deeper into consumer confidence, the University of Michigan consumer confidence numbers, confidence is very weak because of supply chain issues. Like people don't believe they'll be able to buy goods and services. So they're very, they're, their outlook into the future is very low. If you correlate that to retail sales, it's still very high. So it's kind of like a little bit of a, a curveball with consumer confidence. But if you look at excess liquidity, which I look at it as M2 
on a year-over-year rate of change basis minus nominal GDP, it turns negative in March, April. And I think yeah. that's going to be a challenge. I think um, right now you want to be preparing and focusing on valuations of free cash flow. And you, you've already started to see over a number of months, like everyone's talking about a massive carnage beneath the market and you had to own big tech in order to survive the last couple of months. I mean, I haven't done particularly well since June. I think I'm down like after yesterday, maybe 4%, 5% off an all-time high, but I'm not down huge. And the only big tech company I own is Amazon. Yeah. So I think if you're focusing on companies with um, free cash, strong free cash flow and good valuations, you'll weather the storm and, and they should appreciate better into next year. And that's sort of where I'm focused. So I don't really know what's going to happen, but I think we're going to see um, like overvalued companies. They could have sharp bounces after sharp declines, but I don't know if it's still a good environment for those. When I say yeah. overvalued companies, I'm talking about companies that are like, have no moat, uh, still pr- priced at 100, 150 times um, forward priced earnings, like these type of uh, companies where it's like, okay, how consistent is the revenue moving forward? I don't know. Yeah, no, prof- no path to profitability. Yeah, big challenge. Like that. Yeah, big challenge. Okay. Yeah, well, I mean, let's wrap up there because I'm looking at my camera and it's on 0% battery, so it's probably going to end in a second. So we might as well wrap up there anyway so again i appreciate your time as always and uh i mean we'll try to jump on more frequently i mean i suppose me and you could probably talk to talk for flipping ever if you wanted to there's so many loads of questions that i I missed that and i wanted to ask you so we're definitely gonna have to have to do it again because i've got a list of about 50 things i didn't even get a chance to ask (laughs) next time yeah not a problem it's always the way so yeah thanks anyway cheers for having me thanks mate